Okay, looks like we are live and this is going to be a good one. This is going to be an information packed video, guys. So get yourselves ready. We're leaving no stone unturned. Matt, good to be here, brother. How you doing tonight? Doing good, man. Thanks. This will be fun. <laughs> this is going to be a lot of fun. So guys, if you haven't yet checked it out, um, definitely check out the debate from last night, Garrett versus Morgan. Really, really good debate. And of course, uh, check out the last video we did debunking our um, favorite critic, Gutsick Gibbon. Now, yes, in the thumbnail, there has been an insertion mutation. So it says Gutsick Gibbons. We are, are aware that it's Gutsick Gibbon, but... Um, Gutsick Gibbon is evolving. Information has been added through an insertion mutation. So, uh, Raw Matt and I are now firm believers in fish to fisherman evolution. So, Matt, how's it feel to finally stop denying science? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'll get my Nobel Prize now, finally. Well, <laughs> praise our phenomenal thumbnail maker. He sent me it and I thought this is this is an awesome one. Then I looked at I glanced at it a little more carefully and I went, um, guts at Gibbons. It's guts at Gibbon. And we can only imagine our critics how they nitpick, right? You know, they might say something like, Oh, you can't even spell my name right, and you're you're expecting to debunk me. Well, it worked out perfectly because uh insertion mutation. It's been demonstrated now. It's undeniable, Matt. Uh, new information can be added to the genome. <laughs> All because of the alphabet. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna be touching on a number of things. Make sure to check out the orphan genes video. Definitely irrefutable. I mean, we touched on everything there. Um, we've made a, a video here that we're going to play and go through, kind of like we did uh, with the last one. We've got a lot of stuff we're gonna touch on. Uh, pretty much everything human evolution. We'll be starting off for the most part with fossils and some of her erroneous claims on like Homo floresiensis and some of the other hominins, uh, lots of material. But at the end of the day, and it's funny, Matt, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Genetics is what's most important. And we've even heard from our other favorite critic, Dr. Dan, that he doesn't care about the fossils. When you got the genetics, this is where we can determine ancestry a bone found in the dirt with no genetics okay it's not inherited sperm and egg genes traits and genetics that's what's inherited sperm and egg and we have to repeat this ad nauseum so guts a given she's a good sport this has been fun we got no problems with her but as you're going to see here uh, she ignores in her videos probably i would say about 95 percent of the material we put out she typically dodges the genetics issues she dodges the differentiating lines of evidence that can tell us whether creation's true or evolution's true. And you're going to find that out today. So we are going to touch on the fossils at first, but then we're really, really, really going to hammer down the direct evidence and force her to respond to that which can differentiate between the models. So what are your thoughts on that, Matt? I mean, it's the only thing that makes sense, really, because remember early on when they built their phylogenetic trees before any genetic data was in? And, and then all of a sudden the genetic data came out and the entire trees, they all changed. Remember that? It was like, right. that's because of how far off they were with assumptions. So now there is, it, it's even worse for them because now that we have the genetic evidence, they're actually trying to say that it's good evidence for them. And we like to show that, no, the genetic evidence is actually on our side. The genetic evidence is on our side, exactly. And we covered in great detail in the last video, we asked several questions that we hope she can respond to directly um, on endogenous retroviruses, which our um, brother John Maddox in the chat has mentioned. Um, he says, crazy creationists. <laughs> you guys are living in fantasy land. Yeah, it's true. Isn't that what they say without rebutting the actual evidence and claims? So we've asked some uh, direct questions we've we've gone over that which is um that can kind of differentiate with between humans and chimps for example we discussed the, the similarities but the fact that in our genetics the similarities oftentimes have incredibly different gene expression roles and functions so we're not gonna you know rehash that but definitely check out that video uh ruhif um 
Good question. I know. I'm, I'm sorry to leave you out. We will get to you. <laughs> I know you're the uh, human chromosome two fanatic. I do have some stuff on that in, in my newest refuting the critics book that you will like. Maybe we'll touch on a bit of that today. So Matt, why don't we uh, get right into it then? Um, waste no more time unless you got something else to say in terms of introductions. I guess announcement wise, we've got an interview with a Dr. Hayes on Wednesday, 3.30 EST. Uh, I will be interviewing him on abiogenesis, should be fun. We got Kent Hoven coming back on the 24th to debate Derek Barnes uh, and, and a few other things to look forward to this month as well. But yeah, let's get right into it. Looks like we're getting people coming in now. So Matt, unless you got some final words, we'll get right to our, um, our video we're looking forward to. Yeah, sounds good. Now, I say we jump right into it because uh, we have a lot of content. We would hate to waste it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah, we're going to get through it. Now, people probably laugh because we'll stop every two seconds and um, kind of go on a lot of rabbit trails and take forever to get through the video. We are going to get through the video today. Um, so we won't stop as frequent. Well, we say that now, but we'll see. <laughs> Whatever comes to mind, we'll stop it. But yeah, let's get right to it, uh, Brother Matt. All right, here we go. Screen share time. All right, let me full screen for everybody. Ignore my desktop so you don't have a heart attack. And here we go. Let me know if everybody could hear it. I'll play it. Well, actually, there's no audio in the very beginning. So. This is from her video. And, whoops, I didn't mean to put that there. We already started out with a failure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to touch on that after. That, that's, that's a good slide, but we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. So keep going with this one. Right. Okay, here we get uh, emotionally stunted. He dropped down into the comment section. And uh, well, I, I, go ahead. Well, what's funny is, uh, well, you're going to see too, like we put out an incredibly detailed video. We got the entire team standing for truth brain trust. We had John Maddox in there. We had Nephil and free. We had you. I mean, we killed her entire opening that she had with G man. And she, she pretty much tapped out because she came out with like a 45 minute video touching on like 0.1% of it. Um, and ignored the rest, which is fine. You know, she can't be, uh, none of us can be an expert at everything, but the one line of evidence that she attempted to <laughs> debunk, which was a major, um, line of evidence was uh, directly debunked by her own side in the comment section, because, uh, we were talking about in our video how the evidence from genetics um, seems to indicate that God would have uh, created animals with a greater ability to diversify, okay? In other words, what that means is the original animal kinds were front-loaded with more genetic diversity, more created heterozygosity than humans. This actually makes sense since we know God created populations of animal kinds and then only two humans, Adam and Eve. And lo and behold, we find low genetic diversity in humans today. Okay, this is why the human race has incredibly low genetic diversity, meaning we came from a small population. We're going to touch on it later. They, uh, as, as an ad hoc rescue device, invented that hypothetical population bottleneck. Um, we may play the video later in an after show the other day on John Maddox channel. I asked the question to a geophysicist how that uh, supposed out of Africa scenario is even remotely plausible. And he pretty much had to tap, tap out and say he doesn't have an answer. And he's someone who says he's been doing this for 10 years. So when we actually look at animal kinds, we can see that there's oftentimes um, a lot of diversity, let's say within, you know, the felids, for example, which is what we would expect. So she tried to debunk that by pointing to, um, by pointing to, species, specific species that have experienced bottlenecks, whether it's due to inbreeding, you know, there's a number of reasons that can reduce genetic diversity. Look at the cheetahs, you know, the cat family in general has high levels of genetic diversity because her question to G-Man was if species within the same family that we say is the same kind, say the cats, the feline, some of them have more DNA differences and DNA diversity separating them, yet we as creationists conclude they're the same kind. Then humans and chimps, she'll say, 
have less DNA diversity, DNA differences separating them. So why would we conclude two cat species are of the same kind, yet they're separated by more DNA differences and not conclude that humans and chimps are? Well, like I said, we'd expect the lower levels of genetic diversity in humans, more in the animal kind. So she completely failed right off the bat on one of the 0.1% things that she tried to actually touch on by pointing to a species, believe it was a gorilla one. I'm going to leave the video in the uh, description. Actually, you could see it in the slide before this that has low levels of genetic diversity. And the second I saw it, I said, way to just misrepresent the argument. So I was about to comment, you know, to, to kind of correct her. But then I saw call me, uh, call me emo who said, Oh, Erica, you mishandled SFT's created heterozygosity argument there. You seem to be confusing kinds with species. Nevertheless, great video there. So if you scroll down a bit, Matt, you'll see exactly what I just said. Keep going down. I don't think I can. Oh, so he um, indicated that, let me see here, if I go to his actual comment, because I think you missed out on the um, portion where he explains what I said. So let's see, I'll go to it then. Um, what does he say at the top there? Boom, here it is. I've got it in front of me, so that's fine. You, you took the wrong spot out, it looks like. So he said, SFT, and you can go see this comment there. SFT is arguing that the diversity within the human kind as a whole should be relatively lower than the other kinds because humans started with a single pair. Remember, it's always good to, to represent your opponent's position correctly in order to have a good discussion back and forth. Emo says, and Emo doesn't agree with this, of course, but him and I have had back and forth on this and he, he at least understands the argument. He said, by kind, of course, he's talking about all the species within the barrenman. And then in brackets, he says chimps and bonobos are of the same barrenman. So, yes, there are some species, even, even in humans, there's some subgroups that we've pointed to on islands, for example, and inbreeding that can reduce levels of genetic diversity. But that doesn't mean as a whole, the species reflect just that certain bottlenecked or inbred population, just like the cheetahs, you know. So she was just uh, cherry picking one species that has had reductions in their genetic diversity when in fact if you were to look at the entire family overall they would have higher levels of genetic diversity and that's why the animal kinds for example when they would have come off the ark the bottleneck it was short-lived and it was followed by rapid uh, population growth rapid accelerated population growth so very very little of that original created heterozygosity would have been lost and because the animal kinds were front loaded with more genetic diversity, that means they would have come off the ark with more genetic diversity, of course, than humans. Uh, humans were created in two, animal kinds were created in bulk. So I just found that funny that um, I was going to correct her and I didn't even need to because um, Emo did for us. And I... I've stated this multiple times in debates anyway. So it's good to, to uh, represent your opponent's position correctly. So, uh, that, you know, what, what are your thoughts, Matt? And then we can move on, brother. Sure. I was just thinking about it from a logical perspective. If, if humans and chimpanzees actually share a lot of these uh, similarities and there's only a few substitution differences between us, but yet there's more differences between dogs. Well, wait a minute. Shouldn't there be many more differences if we split from these 6.5 million years ago? I mean, if you literally watch a new dog breed come into existence and it has more substitution differences than the nearest breed that it comes from, then obviously time isn't the factor. So... I just find it pretty ironic then that they can say, oh, well, we have pretty similar substitutions, similarities between chimpanzees. Yes, it's 55 or 60, but, you know, it's pretty close. Well, it shouldn't be close, even according to your own theory, right? I right. Mean, what's that far ago? So you can't say that it's close when it should be far, because, but you know how they do it. Anything is evidence to them. Well, and, and that's the thing. Even the amount of DNA differences that separate chimpanzees 
from humans, even if we were to go with a conservative estimate, like 30 million. I mean, there's a massive waiting time problem. How do you fix that many differences, even according to their own model, which would suggest a split roughly maybe six to 10 million years ago? Uh, because we've got roughly, you know, conservatively 30 million differences, DNA differences that separate um, chimpanzees from humans. So they have a huge waiting time problem there. Now, it's not a problem for us because our model suggests that the DNA diversity was front loaded, of course. So we don't need the time to explain the DNA differences because they can be front loaded uh, at creation, which makes sense. Um, according to our model, leads to testable predictions, of course, on speciation rates, mutation rates, DNA function. That means those differences are already built in. So they'll say, oh, you believe in hyperspeciation. No, because the differences are there from the start. The majority are created DNA differences. Therefore, recombination, gene conversion, genetic drift, isolation, inbreeding, so on and so forth can lead to new species quickly. And that's why we see all of these examples in our genetics, like, you know, the epigenome, for example, that suggests forward thinking. These are forward thinking mechanisms, you know, and all they have is speculation as to how natural selection could evolve that which is long-term. And when they do that and they speculate, they're essentially giving evolutionary mechanisms, natural selection and mutation, a mind, which is ridiculous. Um, yeah, the, thoughts matter. Did you want to move on, brother? No, that's it. Well said, man. That's true. They're, 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 listen to the speculation in this video you're about to watch right now. They, they found evidence and then they fill in the gap with their storytelling. They make an assumption about the past based on what they already believe to be true, and you can hear it played throughout. Now, this is a secular evolutionary video you're about to listen to, and they admit that the very things that are supposed to evolve into one another are actually all found at the same time. Here we go. Two million years ago, our world was a very different place. The geography, for the most part, we would recognize. We don't know exactly what happened. In fact, nearly all of the details are missing. Such is archaeology. Just making sure. Can everybody hear that good? I can definitely hear it. Okay, sounds good. Yet, new evidence only discovered in the last couple of years would suggest that during this far-flung epoch, a highly unusual meeting took place. An unprecedented meeting of minds. A convergence of three separate evolutionary lines, all inhabiting the same continent in time. One we know well, Homo erectus. It's us, or what we were anyway common ancestor for all humans alive today. The other individuals are older, different, but not so different to be unrecognizable, perhaps. One, Paranthropus, is thought to be a distant cousin. Like Homo erectus, these barrel-chested proto-people walk upright used tools, and crucially, they may have harnessed fire. Could they communicate, have a conversation even? We simply don't know. And finally, we have the third hominid found at the site, already ancient by the standards of the time. A relic of the past that walked the earth from around 4.2 million years ago for around 2.2 million years. For during this time, their days were numbered. This is Australopithecus. And when our ancestors, not quite us yet, but well on the way, arrived in Southern Africa, presumably from elsewhere, for a time, these three early humans all inhabited the same landscape. What did they think of one another? Was there a form of respect between them? Recognition of mutual lineage? Or, as has so often blighted our world, 
conflict. Australopithecus is the most primitive of the trio. Its lineage dating back to at least 3.3 million years ago. Combining ape-like features like long tree-climbing arms along with human-like ones. The exact relation to modern humans remains unknown. The last of its kind, likely dying out not long after its time around the caves of South Africa. For this is an evolutionary dead end. Next, we have Paranthropus, an offshoot of the human family tree, though not considered a direct human ancestor. Known for its large, powerful jaws and teeth, perfect for a diet of nuts, seeds, roots and tubers. As far as early hominins are concerned, we only have scratch of evidence to go by. The physical remains of Denisovans, for example, are mostly known from a single cave system. Nevertheless, from this time onwards, Homo erectus, Paranthropus and stone tools begin to appear all over South Africa, relatively in abundance. They lived alongside each other here for more than a million years to come. Surely some kind of accommodation must have been reached during that time. If not interbreeding, like we know Neanderthals and Homo sapiens did later. Australopithecus, however, simply couldn't keep up. We have to ask the question, did the two newer human groups band together against the old? Could the two younger species interact? Both used tools, and with an argument, they both used fire. Perhaps the reason they became more advanced in the first place. Surviving down from the trees with predators around using this new technology. Whereas Australopithecus remained to a certain extent tree bound. The last days of Australopithecus and the dawn of Homo erectus witnessed here nearly two million years ago, entangled in and around a South African cave system, are now definitively putting to rest the old idea of one species simply going extinct to be replaced by another. The truth is far more fluidic, complicated, overlapping. As late as 117,000 years ago, Homo erectus still lingered on in parts of Indonesia, just as our modern human ancestors began to walk the earth. Maybe they met too. Only time will tell what more developments are unearthed. You've been watching Archaeology News. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know what you think in the comments. And I'll see you on the next one. So you probably noticed a lot in that, like I did. <laughs> well, it's um, a lot, a lot of speculation, and the fact that these so-called human ancestors of ours have all coexisted, intermingled. They've overlapped. It's nothing but a bushy mess. Everybody's going to see in, in a, a clip from a lecture we have later where the evidence for the coexistence of all the Australopithecines, all our so-called uh, an human ancestors, <laughs> we've all lived together. Uh, there's evidence suggesting that the Homo genus ate the Australopithecines and it's nothing but... See, the more they find out, the more confusing it gets and they will oftentimes um, admit that. And another funny thing is um, when it comes to Homo erectus, for example, if we were to assume, because we know evolutionists are constantly invoking massive extinction events and they would have to, like for example, they're doing it to account for the genetic evidence we have. 
in the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, and levels of genetic diversity, but they even have to invoke massive extinction events to account for the numbers of people on the planet today. If you look at the numbers that they're given for the dates, okay, and the dates are, all, are always all over the place, of course, can't be trusted. If you actually look at their model and take it seriously, okay, if we assume their model, let's, let's suggest that there were roughly a million Homo erectus on the planet for about a million years, given their story. Their average time being between 20 and 30 years, okay? That would mean there should be billions of dead bodies within the time frame. Proponents of evolution suggest that Homo erectus existed. Matt, where are all the dead bodies? Because as a matter of fact, we can take all of the fossils that have been designated or that are associated with Homo erectus, and they can literally fit in the trunk of a car. So where's the billions of dead, dead bodies? It's clear that they have never existed. It's because ape to man evolution has never happened, Matt. Exactly. Exactly. They're, that's why they go, oh, well, fossils are rare and we shouldn't find them. So right. it, it, <laughs> I asked that to uh, David and that was it. Well, we just started looking, he said. <laughs> and it, you know, um, one thing I'm going to put to bed too. And my brother Tony is going to love this. I use this because I'm sick of them saying that created heterozygosity is a rescue device. When we constantly, Matt, we have hour, hours and hours and hours of videos, debates, discussions, going over the numbers of testable predictions that flow from it, as well as accurate retrodictions. But think of the alternative, okay? And Erica, who we are debunking today, wants to talk a big game about abiogenesis. I recommend going to watch the John Maddox debate with Erica on that. They've got no evidence for any origin of life situation. DNA is not going to work. Therefore, they've looked to, as our brother Tony always uh, as our brother Tony has expounded upon, the RNA world. And what's funny is I told this to David. I said, okay. And he exaggerated what's going on in the origin of life world and, and research, for example. And I said, you want to you wanna scoff at created uh, heterozygosity? Okay, let's look at your um, origin of life state right now. These RNA world experiments, which they have had to look to, of course, because nothing else in, is working, consists of a lengthy series of highly orchestrated steps. And these steps include purifying desired products, removing unwanted byproducts, changing physical and chemical conditions. They're constantly adding unrealistically high concentrations of assisting substances and other interventions to ensure that the target molecules are achieved. What we're looking at here are highly manipulated, controlled chemistry that has no relevance to the early earth. They are failing miserably on the origins of life, but then they want to scoff at our hypothesis that suggests that God created groups of organisms and did not want those organisms to reproduce by cloning and therefore front loaded genetic diversity into their genomes. The alternative is impossible. There's no evidence for it. They're the ones with the post hoc ad hoc fairy tale. Okay. And I can ask any evolutionist, provide us real empirical testable data on your origins of life scenario, or actually deal with the data, deal with the predictions, deal with the retrodictions that are flowing from our model of created heterozygosity. So I know that was a mouthful, but I wanted to put that to bed. And I, I challenged David Neff on that the other day in our debate. And he had no response because he knows, everybody knows. Matt, how many times have we asked in debates, you know, where did the first life come from? Oh man. We don't know, <laughs> we don't know. But then they want to scoff at front-loaded genetic diversity, which is the far more plausible alternative. Go ahead, Matt. No, no, it's exactly right. Matter of fact, uh, I remember early on in the debates when you wanted to press the issue, I was just say, ah, oh, we'll give you creation. Wait, wait, what? I mean, remember with Snake? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it was abiogenesis. Well, let's talk on that for a minute. He goes, No, I'll give you abiogenesis. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. You just well, they'll give it. it. Yeah. <laughs> they'll give it because they know there's no evidence. And then when we look to our model and, and we talk about all the many numerous specific predictions on DNA function, if created heterozygosity is true, if there's any validity to it. And it turns out the non protein coding RNAs in our genome, they regulate 
nearly all aspects of the gene expression pathway. We found genome-wide functionality in the DNA elements such as ERVs, retrotransposons, ALU, pseudogenes, pseudogenes that they have said are nothing but genetic mistakes, produce RNAs that actually increase the expression of what? Their corresponding functional genes. ERVs are regulating gene expression in the testes, mammary glands, gastrointestinal tract, orphan genes. Go watch our two-hour video, Destroying Guts at Gibbon, on orphan genes. And even going to introns. We know introns are not just passive spacers anymore. They are rich in splicing factor recognition sites. We've got prediction after prediction, retrodiction after retrodiction on mutation rates, speciation rates, DNA function. But they don't want to address the data but they want to scoff at created heterozygosity, but they want to give no empirical data and evidence for abiogenesis. They are failing miserably, Matt. What are your thoughts, brother? Yeah, they hate it. They always, they want to play the game of like, oh, how, you know, look at the dominoes, how the dominoes, you know, look at how they fall. Look at how they're shaped. It's like, wait, where did the dominoes come from? Why are they there? Oh, who cares? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Have dominoes without it something making the dominoes but they want to play stupid they want to say creation doesn't have a creator you know what i mean they're just they just like to hop skip around and go oh well we don't know and we can say we don't know oh really because frankly you say it a lot and the, in in live debates when you're real bold with people that don't know it you're real strong with that stuff that you don't know but <laughs> i'm just saying right there you go. A little bit of genetic evidence starts to come out and, oh, well, you know, I'm not a biologist. Okay. Yep, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a geneticist. But if they're going up against a creationist who's not that familiar with these data, suddenly they are biologists and, genetic and geneticists. And you're going to see that here soon in a clip where we have Erica educating R and Ron molecular clocks. Apparently Erica is the... Uh, Expert, yeah. uh, expert on that. So maybe we, um, yeah, maybe we'll move on. But definitely wanted to. We, we got a lot more um, goodies ahead of us. So uh, good okay. point, brother. Okay, here we go. Because this is directly from a book that you have. So let the audience see this one. Here we go. There you go. Right. Yeah. The island of Flores, so Homo floresiensis. So, um, yeah, let's get into that point. And real quick, Matt, do we have the accelerated nuclear decay sure. screenshot from our series? Do we have to, maybe we'll do that part first and then jump right into this. If you think that that's. Yeah. Let me see where I put it. And then we'll. Cause I want to point out the fact that she's been, and like I said, she's a good sport. We got nothing against her. She the debates are respectful, cordial. Um, but the problem is, and, and they brought in Dan, I think for the damage control. Okay. On the genetics aspects, and especially looking back on those, um, those videos we've done <laughs> Poor Dan, Dan, the pseudoscience man, he's pretty much done for and David Neff. <laughs> so, Neanderthals, why are they so different? Why are they so divergent? Well, we know that genetic drift can occur rapidly, Matt, if you want to touch on this, leading to rapid fixation of new mutations in small populations. And we know what the conditions that the Neanderthals experienced. We know the conditions associated with their existence. We know how inbred they were. We know that they experienced rapid accelerated genetic degeneration and rapid fixation of these deleterious mutations. And Dr. Dan wants to deny that this is a plausible explanation to explain their divergence. You know, he wants to double down. So in, in a live chat the other day, I asked David, I said, you know, what does, um, what results from small populations, especially for long periods of time? And, and he said, okay, of course, yeah, d genetic drift will lead to rapid um, fixation of new mutations because he looks to the genetic markers, right? So he's just doubling down. He's got nothing left. Maybe Erica can help him on that one. But here's here's the accelerated nuclear decay, okay? We've got video upon video. So she put out a heat problem video, about 45 minutes long. We've got a few videos that kind of breaks it down in an easy to understand way for um, just the general audience. We've got an extremely technical one 
going over all the numbers of ways that the heat problem can be uh, resolved. And also we put out a video kind of recently, and you're going to see it here in the next slide, um, demolishing dating methods, evidence for accelerated nuclear decay right here. So here's the video for Guts at Gibbon, the, the heat problem. Watch that video, then go look at, at all our videos. Go look at the nearly three hour one where we had brother Jeremy in there and we touched on every single point. I predict she probably hasn't even looked at that one. They wanna complain about the heat problem all day, every day and that video, oh and we've even got an extensive debate with David Neff on that where we touch on the heat problem, all these things. I've yet to see a response on the rate project results that suggest evidence for accelerated nuclear decay in the rocks themselves, fission tracks, radio halos, helium, for example. Okay, testable predictions on the flood model regarding cold slabs, for example. Uh, catastrophic plate tectonic predictions, retrodictions. We touch on all that in that uh, nearly three hour video with Jeremy. That's evidence in the rocks that accelerated nuclear decay has occurred. There's been no response. Um, even on the field that, you know, Guts at Gibbon thinks destroys our model, has been addressed thoroughly. So uh, the whole point is, yeah, what these evolutionists will do is they'll try and address 0.0001% of what we put out and ignore everything else because they know they can't address it. <laughs> you know, well, you know, we're not falling for that game. Everything that's been said has been addressed thoroughly. Tonight's going to be extremely thorough, thorough as well. So I just wanted to point that out. Matt, what are your thoughts? No, exactly. I mean, what I don't understand is you can portray something as, as, as detailed as possible, but in reality, sometimes you just need to say, look, this is the person that's the specialist on. This is what they have to say on the matter. And we have lots of different answers for the same problem. There isn't just one answer. So it's been answered and it's been answered by multiple people because you got to remember there's conflicting models that exist even in ours, just like there is in the evolutionary model and they compete with each other. One says, no, I've solved the heat problem. Another person says, no, I have. So there's multiple pr people that are working on, on if they even think it's an issue to begin with. I know Walt Brown doesn't have a heat problem with his model, but uh, his is different. His model, his heat problem isn't with tectonic shifting and plate movement. His heat problem is from the actual fountains of the great deep breaking. System. But that's relevant. Right now. Anyway. Well, what's funny, I'll make one last point there is even if, even if there really was no solution to the so-called heat problem, and we've, we've uh, provided many reasonable explanations, okay? It doesn't matter because we have evidence directly in the rocks themselves. This was a prediction by the rate team before going into it. And they discovered, and in that specific video, for anybody you know really technically minded, go look at it. We had all of us there. Jeremy was there, who's kind of an expert at this as well. And we touched on for three hours. We didn't just say fish and tracks, radio halos, helium. We went into each one in great detail, 20, 30 minutes each, for those that want to kind of dig deeper. So if Erica still wants to use this heat problem argument, she's going to have a lot of work to do to actually go address the evidence directly in the rocks that nuclear accelerated nuclear decay has occurred. Because hypothetically, if, there's, if there was no explanation as of yet for the heat problem, well, we have the evidence in the rocks that it occurred. We have the predictions based on the flood model. We have predictions with rapid magnetic reversals coming from Russell Humphreys, predictions on helium, predictions from Baumgartner on the cold slabs, for example. Prediction after prediction, you know, the evidence is there. Now, there are solutions. She's going to say there is no solutions. Fine. But go address the actual evidence that is undeniable for accelerated nuclear decay. And we haven't seen that yet, and I doubt we ever will. So I would say that that can be put to bed, put to rest, so. Absolutely, and stay tuned, because we got a flood book coming out soon. <laughs> but here we go, back to this. Boom, island isolation. Anyway, so, hey, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, I can comment it, or you, whoever wants to start, I guess. I would just want to let people know what what would happen do you think if you moved out to an island and you had kids and on that island were some coconut trees and maybe some guava because it grows like a weed and your your children eat that as their main staple 
And there's not many other foods. They really can't find anything else. You know, maybe every so often they can eat some grubs if they decide to eat bugs for some crazy reason. Or what do you think is going to happen after a few generations? Cal caloric intake isn't very high because there's not many calories there. It would be stupid to grow six foot five on an island where there's not a caloric you know, surplus for you to be. So you would start shrinking through generations because that's what would have to happen for your survival. That's one of the reasons that we see lots of these little hobbit-like people when we look around. These aren't intermediary species showing that a chimpanzee is becoming smaller and progressing to man. It's actually showing humans reducing in size. Go ahead. Oh, you probably left. <laughs> anyway, this is from a, a book that Standing for Truth has specifically regarding island isolation. It says the island of Florence, where Homo florensis comes from, has long been separated from Australia and Asia. Its isolation could, over a long period of time, have led to the hominin species living there shrinking in size when compared to their mainland relatives, a phenomenon known as island dwarfism. And that is how it happens. It's mostly from caloric intake. Obviously, you're not going to grow huge with no calories. And that's one of the main reasons why this happens. It's a reductive process. This is not beneficial. Well, it's funny because you'll see that she's had to double down. Okay, because a lot of paleo experts agree that Floresiensis, the hobbits, are a variant, a dwarfed version of Erectus. And according to our model, and we've gone over the numerous lines of evidence suggesting that Erectus itself is a mutant form of Homo sapiens. Of course, a little bit before Babel. Some people groups after Babel, they would have they would have migrated, they would have became isolated, and we see this on islands. And what's funny is with Floresiensis, she now has to go to another hypothesis, saying that you know, no, they came from the Australopithecines or maybe Habilis, for example, because it's too close for comfort for her to admit. Or agree. Now, here's the thing: you can find a quote from anybody supporting your position. So now she wants to cherry pick some papers and quotes suggesting the hypothesis that they came from the Australopithecines or Habilis, and then ignore all the other paleo experts that suggest that they came from Erectus. Well, we're gonna we're gonna cover this in great detail. So there is extensive evidence that shows that um, the Hobbit came from Erectus and is essentially Homo sapiens. Many paleo experts would agree Erectus is, is human. Therefore, hobbits are human too. Like you pointed out on an island, what can happen is serious inbreeding. Okay. So the hobbits were subject to serious inbreeding. And what happens as a result is certain anomalous or atypical features, say the curved fingers, toes, um, with the hobbit specifically, small cranial capacities, small bodies, small stature. These are all just common occurrences um, that you'll find in island dwarfism. And what they will look at to say are primitive or maybe Australopith-like to say that they came from the Australopithecines instead have actually been detected and observed. And we're going to have some slides on this um, in the small bodied humans on Luzon. It's, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an island where um, reductive evolution has been observed as well. Homo luzonensis. Okay. And uh, um, let's see, maybe we'll move to, right. So let's go to maybe the next slide. This is just a little more information on, there we go. Homo luzonensis, new human species found in the Philippines. Uh, let's see, go to the next one maybe. Because what we're going to get at is this is a common occurrence on islands, okay? Um, yeah, here's a great one. I'm going to get rid of so I can see. 
So when they found floresiensis, island dwarfism, this is what happens. Reductive evolutions at play, genetic degeneration. All of these so-called primitive features are easily the result. And we can conclude that they are the result of pathology, disease, for example. Okay. Now, Professor Chris Stringer, as you can see here, he said, after the remarkable finds of the diminutive Homo floresiensis were published in 2004, I said that the experiment in human evolution conducted on the island of Flores could have been repeated on many of the other islands in the region. Um, and then he says that speculation has seemingly been confirmed on the island of Luzon with the Homo luzonensis. And we've also seen this in Nalidi, okay, exactly consistent with our model, of course. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the primitive features that they're going to point to, right, they want to look at the most anomalous features, atypical features. They want to say these are mosaic or these are transitional, when in fact they have been um, concluded by many paleo experts. The obvious conclusion is that they are due to pathology, especially with island dwarfism. This is just what happens. It's well, um, it, it's well, documented. So even with Homo floresiensis, with Nalidi, Nalidi, you see the same curved fingers, right? The same curved phalanges. You see a lot of the same uh, pathological features in now Homo luzonensis. This is a, a newer one, for example. What a coincidence. All of these similar features on islands, which as a consequence, over many, many generations, you're looking at inbreeding, reductive evolution, of course. Um, and as you can see from that quote, this has been speculated because this has been, um, th this is obvious. And island dwarfing is, is, is a real phenomenon, Matt, like you said. Those, those similar looking features, okay, have s that are the result of pathology are, are seen in modern humans as well. So if you're looking at the island dwarfing, like we see founder effects, okay, because we're looking at independent reoccurrence on different islands, Matt, and you're seeing this, the, the same, somewhat similar, a uh, little different, but similar for the most part, anomalous traits in all of these small bodied human populations, Nalidi, Floresiensis, uh, Floresiensis, which are the hobbits, Homo luzonensis. This isn't just coincidence. And all three of these species coexisted recently, overlapped, even according to the uh, paleo experts. All three of these small bodied species lived in the same extreme isolation, in highly inbred, stuck on islands. They developed certain unique features, right? The small stature, the curved fingers, the toes, the things that they point to. <laughs> in fact, you can find so many paleo experts agreeing that the hobbits are erectus. Erica would want to point to the astralopith like features when in fact those are easily attributed to pathology. Um, there's another disease too. Like for example, it's been suggested that like Hobbit specifically could also be the result of not just microcephaly. Okay. Cause in her video, you'll find that just, she wants to talk about microcephaly, microcephaly when in fact they've concluded an assortment of diseases. Okay. An assortment of, pathology, for example, um, cretinism, uh, that can produce all these same features. Okay. As well as, um, down syndrome. And you can see in the own papers, like there's a quote here. Okay. That states, let's see here. Interestingly, Scientists have also argued that Homo floresiensis shows physical features that are reminiscent of those found in Australopithecines. But other researchers have argued that the hobbits were descended from Homo erectus, but that some of their anatomy reverted to a more primitive state due to degeneration, reductive evolution. This is exactly what, what we're saying. Um, here's, the, here's the one, the um, Cretanism. So what did he say? According to distinguished evolutionist Charles Oxnard, many of the pathological features of Cretanism mimic the primitive characters of evolution, making it easy to mistake 
Pathological features for primitive characters. Isn't that funny? They're looking at the so-called primitive features, primitive characteristics, atypical bones, trying to say that they're mosaic or transitional like Erica does. She doesn't want to hold to the uh, erectus hypothesis, um, but she wants to point to the primitive bones. Um, here's another one with uh, Nalidi. A case of variation or pathology in Homo erectus. Pathology really is the best explanation for the anomalous looking human bones that we find on these remote uh, islands. You can see in, um, you can see it documented heavily in, in contested bones. I haven't seen any strong refutation of that. But even with the, the curvature of the fingers that they'll look at, Matt, you'll see this. Um, You'll, you'll see this frequently as, as pointed to as primitive or astrolopith like we know that uh, curvature in the fingers can be caused by mechanical strain from habitual behavior, right? Repetitive stress type injuries. Um, but at yeah. the same time, the curvature can also be caused by uh, deformation due to pathology and disease. Now think about this when you're looking at vitamin D deficiency. Okay. Let's say uh, you can get rickets from that. And these hobbits are these already highly degenerated human forms. Now, because we've seen uh, tools, especially on the island of Flores with these hobbits. So habitual tool use or just other repetitive use of the hands, for example. If the bones are already weak and diseased due to pathology, that means like, let's say vitamin D deficiency, the result of reductive evolution, of course, um, disease pathology. That means the curvature can be it, um, emphasized even more. And this is all the same type of features that you see in the small bodied, um, small bodied humans on these islands. And um, even a lateral flaring of the ilium of the pelvis can be uh, pathological in modern humans. Another feature that is observed in Cretanism. Um, and we see it in Homo erectus makes sense that the hobbits were a more degenerated form of um, Homo erectus. The curved fingers, like I said, like I said, the best explanation that it's due to some sort of bone pathology, vitamin D deficiency, um, and it's just going to accelerate even more because they are already riddled with disease, island uh, dwarfism, because founder effects even Lee Berger said this, uh, um, that founder affects genetic isolation and a high inbreeding coefficient can resort um, in these problems. And real quick before I want your take on it, it is a huge problem for Erica's ridiculous theory, okay, that the pre-humans on – uh, that she says are pre-human or she wants to look to the astralopithecine hypothesis instead of the erectus hypothesis on floors. How did those pre-humans, if they're just so primitive, how did they get to that island in the first place, Matt? We know it was never accessible through a land bridge, even during the ice age where we know sea levels would have been lower. Erica would then have to say, this is the fatal blow to her uh, hypothesis. She'd have to say that it either happened by accident for example, let's say through natural rafting of vegetation or like a tsunami or a cyclone or something. This is just mental in invention, storytelling. Because yeah, maybe this could happen to one individual, but it's very implausible to have occurred in a to a viable breeding population that we see with the hobbits. The best explanation, which they have to reject, because it speaks of true humanity. It also uh, speaks to the fact that the erectus hypothesis is far more superior than the habilis one or the astralopithecine one. The hobbits obviously sailed to the island, okay, which makes sense since they were clearly human. They're a variant of erectus, as many paleo experts could say. She can, she can cherry pick quotes that's, that say anything. The erectus hypothesis makes the most sense. She has to fight it because it doesn't, it's too close for comfort for her. all the, all the lines of evidence and indications suggest that Floresiensis was 100% human and the sailing to get to the Island. Okay. That is purposeful navigation. Okay. This speaks of humanity building boats and then navigating the open seas is clear indication that Erectus, and as a consequence, the hobbits, which are dwarfed variants of Erectus, are human. You know, there, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. What are your thoughts, brother? 
Well, th- I would say also think about it. You listening right now probably know somebody who's lived long enough to get um, ulnar drift or that has rheumatoid arthritis or that has, what is that? Uh, Kemper, uh, what is that? Camperdactyly. It's basically where your fingers start to curve. Um, they drift off to the side and, and bend. It's a it's a it's a bone degenerative disorder that happens as you age as well. So there's there's one that happens not even to people that are forced into reductive evolution or isolated or inbreeding. It just happens with older age. So if you, it happens to your great grandparents that you probably remember it happening to, but yet all of a sudden, no, it's just an intermediary species. <laughs> well, how is that possible, right? I mean, just basic logic would dictate that, hey, I know somebody that has curved fingers and they're old and it happened because of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, that right there gives it away as well. Because like you said, there's no DNA. We don't know how old these individuals were. Right. Elderly. Well, there's more examples. Well, that's the thing. We can make a prediction right now because we know from the DNA from Neanderthals, okay? Now, the conditions associated with the Neanderthals and some of the other hominins, I guess, have, have made it a little bit more easier to get the DNA. Uh, because of the environment and due to chemistry. It, it oftentimes comes down to chemistry and not age. Here's the thing. We have now confirmed that <laughs> Neanderthals have interbred with humans and, of course, with the Denisovans. We don't have genetics, okay? And this is why we're putting this to bed because even Dr. Dan has said he doesn't care about the fossils. It's genetics. That's the direct line of ancestry. We are putting this whole fossil thing to bed, okay? We could probably predict right now Matt, off the off the cuff, if we did manage to get the DNA from Erectus or from uh, Homo floresiensis or Homo luzonensis or Nelidi, we we could probably predict safely that they're going to fall within the same range as we have seen with the Neanderthals in the fact that they're clearly human. Exactly. There. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we keep that keeps happening. Remember with Neanderthal? Oh, they couldn't speak. They definitely couldn't speak. Oh, <laughs> their rib cage shows that they were less human. And then all of a sudden, here they are, red-headed gingers. <laughs> you know, no, <laughs> no big deal. Oh, and another thing that came to mind, you know, they sell finger splints. You know what, uh, you know, like uh, when you break your arm, when you got to splint it up to make sure it right. stays. They make finger splints for people because their fingers start to curve in age. <laughs> well, that, that, and that's what's funny. Okay, so we've seen that all of these hominins, the Australopithecines, Paranthropus, they've all coexisted, intermingled, they've overlapped. <laughs> Makes sense according to our model. Yeah, they're going to come up. See, the thing is the evolutionists, there's no way to falsify because they'll just force fit the data, rearrange the story. But here's the thing. We have no reason to accept their explanations for things, their conclusions, because this is what we'd expect overlapping coexistence especially coming after the off of the ark especially with the australopithecines um post babel you got luzonensis you got nalidi you got hobbits yeah they've got some differences in their variations but overall we're looking at pathology disease they're all isolated on islands you can see on the island of where the hobbits are we've touched on this you're looking at dwarfed elephants islands do really weird things to species, to animals, to humans. This is exactly what, I'm gonna read something right from the horse's mouth, okay? This can be found on uh, in contested bones here, okay? So it says, in a separate article in Nature, Morwood and colleagues explain in detail why island dwarfing may be the best explanation for hobbits' small body and brain size and other skeletal abnormalities. Okay, other mechanisms must have been responsible for the small body size of these hominins, with insular dwarfism being the strongest candidate. It has been argued that in the absence of agriculture, tropical rainforests offer a very limited supply of calories for hominins. Under these conditions, this is the reductive uh, evolution right here, under these conditions, selection should favor the reduced energy requirements of smaller individuals. Remember, natural selection, right, Matt? I'm not quoting anymore, but natural selection looks to the short term. How do I live till tomorrow? Natural selection isn't thinking about getting cancer 50 years from now. No, it needs to survive till tomorrow. That's why with the Neanderthals or the Africans, you know, in Africa, some of the harshest conditions, 
being so close to the equator. Therefore, mutations in DNA repair mechanisms would be a major um, consequence of this. We know this with the Neanderthals too, that would speed up mutation rates. Let me go back to this quote. So uh, it says, dwarfing in LB1 may have been the end product of selection for small body size in a low calorific environment, either after isolation on Flores or another insular environment in Southeastern Asia. Isn't that funny? It continues. In their published paper, Weston and colleague make, it, make a noteworthy observation. Anatomical and physiological changes associated with insular dwarfism can be extensive with dramatic modification of sensory systems and brain size, and certainly exceed what might be predicted by the allometric effects of body size reduction alone. Um, they continue, island dwarfing is well known among mammals. Released from predation pressure or constrained by restricted resources and limited by population size, the phenomenon can be dramatic. I'll read this next sentence and I'll end it here. Such dramatic changes caused by island dwarfing can easily account for hobbits, diminutive size, small brain, and unique skeletal traits without the need to claim it was a sub human species. And what's funny is it continues here. Uh, it says, again, this is precisely what the discovery team originally reported. Isn't that funny? In their announcement paper published in Nature 2004, it says, the describers originally proposed that Homo floresiensis was the end product of a long period of isolation of Homo erectus or early Homo on a small island, a process known as insular dwarfism. Well, you guys can... Um, read all about this yourself, but is it a coincidence that we see this on islands? That one guy that we read the quote from, he almost per expected this. Homo luzonensis, Homo nalidi, Homo floresiensis, Neanderthals, we actually have their genetics. They were highly inbred, suffered from a high genetic load, had high, high levels of uh, homozygosity. Uh, we talked about the genetic, uh, rapid genetic drift earlier. Uh, Heidelbergensis, for example. Now what's funny is, these are all on our side, these hominins, okay, especially the ones that we have the DNA for. Then all Erica's left with is a couple of highly fragmented uh, so-called hominin species like Habilis and Sediba. So now, so desperate, backed up into a corner, this is all they have left. When all the other examples of hominins fit perfectly with our model of post babel separation, isolation, inbreeding, rapid genetic degeneration. And what's funny, Matt, as you can see here, I know it's a mouthful, but uh, we're getting this evidence and the conclusions right from the horse's mouth, right from the paleo experts. Now she wants to cherry pick and say, okay, you know, she wants to look to another hypothesis. Okay. <laughs> Did they accidentally get to that island, Matt? Or is the evidence pretty clear that they had the human capabilities, the human mind to sail there? purposeful navigation. What are your thoughts, brother? Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the problem with uh, their model. They have to um, use a lot of creativity to say like, well, we found fire there. So maybe Homo erectus taught them how to use fire. You see what I mean? There's always some kind of weird twist to things. And then it's like, well, where did they go? Well, they probably didn't like each other and they killed each other off. Wait a minute. You just said that they helped them create fire. Then they killed them. It doesn't even make sense. See what I mean? <laughs> yeah. like, what? Yeah. Did you forget what you said five minutes ago? <laughs> Unbelievable. But isn't it, yeah. Isn't it funny how, you know, the, the fossils themselves, the evidence we see is all in line with the biblical based model, but then the direct evidence, the genetic evidence, the same thing, but then that's the one that's ignored. Right. The one they hate the most, exactly. The one they hate the most. Of course, they lean on the most. When you always say, like, um, when they go, what's your best evidence uh, for creation? And I don't know. You go, well, a biogenesis. They go, well, that's not biology. We're talking about evolution here. What's your best evidence against evolution? And you go, well, why don't you go first and you tell me what's your best evidence for evolution? They go, well, the fossil record. Wait, what? You just told me I can't use a biogenesis because that's not biology. But yet now – you're deviating from biology and going into the fossil record, which you admit there's no DNA evidence for. So it's just a double standard. You know what I mean? They, they love to say that genetic evidence is on their side, but in reality, that's why they, they don't like us using the genetic data anymore because <laughs> it's not. Because no, it's, <laughs> it's really not. And we're, we're really going to hammer that too. So maybe if you're ready, 
Um, this is going to be about a 10 minute section of a lecture from Christopher Rube. Now this is all stuff that uh, Matt and I have talked about before. This is stuff that I've talked about in debates. We haven't been given any responses, rebuttals. Um, you guys are really going to enjoy this. This is something new, just so you're not sitting here listening to us say the same things over and over again. Um, I don't think most people have seen this, but you, this is really informative. You guys are going to love this. So sit back, listen to it. Some fascinating um, evidence here, just demolishing human evolution, ape to man evolution on top of what we've already discussed. So sit back, guys. Enjoy this um demolishing of evolution so go ahead brother all right here we go third major thing that we found was that we're seeing a clear separation between the ape type which they call australopithecus and the human type homo and this as you would expect this is a very natural biblical prediction right we would expect if god created adam and eve and on the same day he created uh, apes and a diversity of apes perhaps we would expect that they would be quite separate and distinct because one did not evolve gradually into the other and so here we have expert in the field saying, no doubt about it, Australopithecines are like apes and the homo group are like humans. And I wanna qualify that because I do not believe based on the research we've done that Australopithecus is a pure hypodyme or a pure uh, genera. What I mean by that is I believe there are a number of human bones, anatomically modern human bones that have been misclassified as Australopithecus. But in general, most of the bones you can say are probably gonna be ape. And we'll talk about some evidence that there's been some mixing. Okay, but that's an interesting point she's making. There are two distinct types, the ape type and the human type. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not variation, right? We know that there are lots of variation in modern human skeletons, people living today. And so you can imagine that we also would expect that in the fossil record. Nevertheless, even accounting for the variation, we still see that you can separate them out. And you can do that whenever you find the, the specimens well-preserved. So if you find a complete um, limb bone that has the diagnostic aspects uh, preserved, such as the distal end or the proximal end, you can actually tell, yes, this is an ape or this is a human. However, when you have very fragmentary remains that are not clearly associated with more bones, then obviously that gets more complicated. But the point is that whenever you find intact, well-preserved specimens, it's very easy to separate them out, human or ape. And so let me just give you an example. Um, Turconoboy. Turconoboy was attributed to the species Homo erectus. And by the way, Homo erectus is, is experts in the field who are called lumpers would say they're, they should be just considered Homo sapiens. Okay, they say the differences have been exaggerated. So think about Turconoboy, is attributed to Homo erectus. We find 90% of its skeleton, I'm guesstimating here. And interestingly enough, since it's a very complete skeleton, you can clearly tell what it is. I'll show you a picture later on. Neanderthals, we have about 500 uh, uh, different Neanderthal sites. So we've had many specimens of Neanderthals and we've, able, we've been able to co uh, uh, compile a composite skeleton. So for all practical purposes, we have the complete skeleton of Neanderthals. We know what they look like. And, un, and contrary to early claims, Neanderthal appears to be fully human anatomically. And so we now, and so it's interesting, we have clarity whenever we have the well-preserved specimens. But now considered, the, the fossils that have been proclaimed as missing- Pause that real quick, Matt. Hardy or Lucy or Setaba or Hablis. You'll notice that all of these so-called missing links are still proclaimed as missing links. Well, Matt, brother, can you hear me? Oftentimes very fragmentary. I think that's interesting because that's when you can in invoke more. Go ahead. Two seconds. So I want everybody to notice this, okay? This is what we were saying earlier. For one, when we have the genetics and when we have the nearly complete skeletons, okay, it's easy to confirm what is, there's a clear separation as you can see here. What is ape? What is the human type? Okay. Now here's what's funny. We've already demolished all of the so-called hominids showing that most of them are just the result of um, accelerated genetic degeneration post Babel, exactly what we'd expect. Now here's the thing. You're going to see here the so-called missing links now. Sadiba, Habilis, Lucy, Artie. <laughs> These are how desperate. This is where they're backed up into a corner. And now let's, this is all they're left with, okay? The ones that are highly incomplete, okay? Look at Habilis, less than 20%, highly fragmented. Artie is just pathetic, extremely crushed, broken, um, so these are the ones now that they have to look to where it's so open to interpretation. There's no genetics, okay? 
And it's just so funny how unconvincing these lines of evidence are. Some random bone, you know, uh, Matt, what do you think? And then we can keep going. Well, it's like you said earlier, right? All of their missing links can fit in the trunk of your car. That's the best evidence that they have, and it's all interpretation. It's subjective. <laughs> exactly. So hopefully she answers that question. Where's the billions and billions of bones? So it's either fossiliz fossilization is rare. <laughs> okay, well, that's why, as Daniel here said in the um, – in the chat, the fossil record should be renamed the flood record. It is rare. And secondly, if you want to resort to David's rescue device, they just started looking. You know, that's just not going to cut it, okay? <laughs> Especially when they invoke to us that we need to find things in the fossil record uh, before the flood. Like, how come we don't find humans mixed in with all kinds of dinosaurs? It's like, wait, you just said we shouldn't even be finding very many <laughs> <laughs> that's a brilliant point yeah and now all of a sudden we should be finding all these humans with dinosaurs when there weren't even many people living before the flood <laughs> <laughs> so there should be billions and billions of so-called pre-humans erectus for example meanwhile they can all fit in the trunk of a car okay now you back them up in a corner on this one and then they want to say oh fossilizations where oh we shouldn't expect them then they want to be hypocrites and ask us the same question when according to our model god created two people adam and eve and then populations of animals millions perhaps of animals and when the time of the flood comes we would expect then billions and billions of animal fossils and then there only would have been i mean given how wicked the world it was at that time i mean there might have just been in the hundreds of thousands maybe of humans probably all situated in one area you know so exactly what we find in the fossil record reflects our starting point two people and then a world full of animals makes sense according to our model where is there billions of fossils if a human evolution is true exactly all right, here we go again. Uh, speculation and artistic license in the reconstructions and in the interpretations. So let's consider Artie. Artie is about uh, a skeleton found in Ethiopia. It's 45% complete. But when Tim White discovered these remains in the early 90s, about 1994, he described them as roadkill. They were pulverized. In fact, the skull was, he said it was pancaked and crushed down to four centimeters in height, broken into 100 pieces. He joked, it's almost like a rhinoceros had stepped on it and crushed it. And so these bones that they're finding, it took them 17 years to reconstruct the already skeleton. And the reason why it took so long is because they couldn't even reconstruct it physically. The bones were so fragile. They were dispersed over, over a span of a mile, over a mile. And so they had to do it recon digitally reconstruct it. They couldn't be sure they were even the same species, despite their claim that they had found a missing link in the oldest human ancestor. And Lucy. Uh, Johansson claims it's 40% complete. Well, actually, if you count the missing bones of the hands and feet as you should, Lucy is actually only 20% complete. And the bones were found eroding out of the hillside in 1974 in a far region of Ethiopia. And he noticed that many of these bones were just scattered and jumbled. He said if it was another rainstorm, they would have washed off the cliff. And he assumed they were all belonged to a single species. But we can be skeptical of that because he had to screen about 20 tons of sediment over, over an area of 50 square meters. And it turns out, that um, they accidentally included a baboon bone in the skeleton and spent on display for decades until just in 2015 they realized mm -hmm. we have a bone that does not belong to this skeleton. And so I wonder, and I am skeptical, I'll reserve my judgments for now until we get a publication that there might be other bones that do not belong to Lucy's skeleton. And now Setaba, same thing, they found Setaba in a pit with thousands of bones of all kinds of different African fauna, 34% complete for one skeleton and 46% complete for the other. And so there was some confusion as to whether or not all the bones belong. And lo and behold, experts now say, some experts say it's actually a mixture of human and ape bones. Habilis, the same thing. It's less than 20% complete. It's, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, but notice that the missing links are generally consistently very fragmentary, very poorly preserved. Why is it that we don't see the missing links of very complete skeletons? Or if we do, um, uh, oftentimes they're in mixed bone beds. Okay, so here's a picture of Turkana boy, which is clearly human. And even the Bishop of Kenya says that he wants the skeleton back to give it a proper burial instead of putting it in the museum. And so experts are now 
pretty surprised since 1984 was discovered. They say it looks like Homo erectus is much more human than we ever imagined. And so here's on the right, though, is a missing link. Uh, belongs to Homo habilis. But if you notice, uh, look how fragmentary the missing link is. Okay. The next major theme we found is that we, we are observing, we are finding that there is an extensive coexistence of the Australopith type with man. That's really interesting because let me just read this quote. So here's from an expert in the field who's saying, humans first evolved in Africa, in East Africa, about 2.5 million years ago, and from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus. So this represents the, the fundamental assumption of the ape to man story that we've been taught since the 70s to the present. And it claims that Australopithecines, like Lucy's kind, which lived about three to four million years ago, gave rise to the earliest members of the genus Homo, such as Homo habilis. And that happened around 2.5 million years ago, the, the earliest members of the genus Homo arose. And so, but now we are finding a lot of evidence, mounting evidence, that anatomically modern human bones are being found in the deepest layers where we find the earliest Australopiths. So that calls into question the fundamental assumption of the ape to man story that is currently being taught all around even the world. And so has this claim though been confirmed by the fossil record? And so I, as I just said, um, we're seeing a reversal of that, of this story. So here's just some evidence. In the 1970s, which is considered the golden decade of paleoanthropology research, that time, that time period in history was instrumental for giving rise to the modern theory. And so at these three major East African sites in Kenya, in, um, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, and in, and in uh, Tanzania, they found numerous uh, thousands of butchered bones, a diversity of stone tools, human footprints, human bones, a windbreak shelter at Aldivai, commun communal centers and living sites. So they found extensive evidence of human culture and human behavior, and even humans buried with Australopiths. And that's interesting. So if we, if Australopiths gave rise to modern humans, why are we, why are they found buried together? So here's famous paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey. He comments on this finding and he says, I see no reason that bands of Homo would not have killed and eaten robust Australopithecines when they could, just as they killed and ate antelopes and other prey animals. And indeed they find these sites and they call them living sites. They're effectively like campsites where they would butcher remains. They would eat them. They would apparently Eating the missing link. How about that? Eh? Human social behavior. And so they're picture nomadic tribes that are simply hunting and eating these, these animals. It's crazy. Richard Lucey, in Nature, in 1971, he says, there's no evidence, however, and by the way, his views haven't, varied, haven't changed much since then. I've uh, been able to talk to him recently. He says, there seems no evidence, however, that the genus Homo at Rudolph, which is Easter Kana, um, had any direct relationship to the Australopithecine population of the same time with which it shared its habitat. The concept of gracile, which means uh, lightly built, Australopithecine being ancestral to Homo and the lower Pleistocene requires careful re-examination. The Lake Turkana material or East Turkana material seems to confirm the view developed as a result of work at Aldivai Gorge, it's Tanzania, that Homo and Australopithecus are two quite separate and distinct early Pleistocene hominins. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the Australopiths did not give rise to the genus Homo, but they were two distinct parallel lineages. They coexisted and they don't have a relationship with each other. He believed that the common ancestor would be much earlier. We still haven't found it around four to six million years ago. We still haven't found that common ancestor. So his view in a way uh, is somewhat reminiscent of the biblical perspective where we see Australopith and man coexisting, okay? Now here's the interesting history that I wanna share with you. So are we finding these types of evidences like stone tools, human bones, and so forth, dating even to the time of Lucy's kind three or four million years ago, which is prior to the origin of the genus Homo? You can understand why that would be a problem, right? So are we finding examples of that? Well, we are. And they were described by none other, none other than even Donald Johansson himself in the 1970s, Anna Leakey's, Mary Leakey and Richard Leakey. So they found human limb bones, human jaw bones, human hands, human foot bones, human footprints. And by the way, they didn't just refer to these as just ah. you know, the homo type. Yep. And what's funny is you'd think if these militant evolutionists were honest, because Erica in one of her recent videos <clears throat> said, oh, you know, standing for truth is misrepresenting me. 
Um, I agree that the Australopithecines uh, coexisted with uh, with humans. Yeah, no, I, I understand that she does because you can't deny the evidence. But here's the thing: they rarely talk about it. They rarely mention because it's a form. It, it's it's psychological warfare. So with the kids, you know, in school and in textbooks, they don't want to emphasize this evidence. When you point it out to them, oh, yeah, of course, this is what the evidence suggests. But they keep it so silent. They don't want to talk about it. And that's the issue. Exactly. And that's exactly what Jungle Jargon just said. He's like, so the humans made the Latoli footprints. Exactly. The person that found him was an anthropologist, I believe. And he was sitting on the beach and he looked over and he saw human footprints. And he goes, wow, those shouldn't be there. Not in that rock layer. So they investigated, and that's what made the history, discovering those footprints in that rock layer where they shouldn't be. That's why they invoked the out-of-Africa theory that now has the uh, has them going back and forth out of Africa because it threw off their entire timeline. They go, well, maybe they left Africa earlier, went there, and then came back again. So just more rescuing devices, ad hoc nonsense. Well, and that's why they can't argue against the fact that what we do oftentimes see is the intermingling of human bones, ape bones, australopithecine bones, and they want to argue so hard against these footprints. Okay, the footprints, the Laetoli footprints, for example, when in fact they have no choice but to admit the coexistence. Therefore, it's entirely plausible that that's exactly what we are finding. But it doesn't fit the evolutionary story. It doesn't fit the evolutionary fairy tale. And we're just talking about fossils here. I mean, the genetics alone destroys them, but the fossils are not on their side either. Oh, and it's going to get so much worse for them over the decades. The more they look, the worse it's going to get. You'll see. All right, here we go. Because that can be pretty broad, according to their definition. They would actually describe them as indistinguishable from modern Homo sapiens, even Homo sapiens. And so this is an interesting bit of history that I'm discussing here. So what happened? And well, in 1976, Donald Johansson and his colleague even reported in the journal Nature that they're finding evidence, and I, you probably can't read it here, it's small, but he's showing that we find clear evidence for the coexistence of Australopithecus and Homo. Of course, that's not the model that's taught today, is it? Because today they teach that no one gave rise to the other. So what happened? Well. Johansson decided to change, he changed his mind completely. He was influenced by Tim White, who was an expert in the field who believed that you can't have more than one hominid species living in the same area of East Africa during a time period of three to four million years ago. So it was called this, the, the, one sing, the, the single species hypothesis. Of it. So he believed uh, all of those bones had to belong to just one type, not Homo and Australopith. And so Johansson was eventually convinced of his model. He changed his mind. So let me just reiterate uh, what I'm saying. He says, so the, this is what I'm writing. So current model was proposed, the current model that we're now taught uh, was, was popularized in the late 70s by John L. Johansson and Tim White, who claimed that all members of the genus Homo descended from Lucy's kind and that the origin of genus Homo aro arose about 2 to 2.5 million years ago. Therefore, according to this popularized model today that is still taught, no anatomically modern human fossils or stone tools should be found buried together with Lucy's kind three to four million years ago. Except the problem is, Donald Johansson just described numerous bones as just looking just like modern Homo sapiens. So he was stuck. And he said, oops, I was wrong. I made a mistake. And it was just a preliminary assessment. And so he changed the story. And then he said, actually, all of those human bones should now be reclassified as, my, as members of my species, Australopithecus afarensis. And Lucy became famous, Johnson, Johansson became famous, and that popularized the model that we now hear, right? Australopithecus giving rise to Homo habilis and Homo erectus and so forth. Okay, so this was uh, an important time in history. Um, but let's go back to that point that I just made. So what about all those human bones though, right? What about all those, the stone tools and things like that, that, you know, things we shouldn't be finding? Well, such findings would falsify the popularized ape man story, as I'm explaining. So, here's what's happening in recent uh, in recent uh, years. It turns out Johansson's original assessment was more accurate than he than he than we realize. <laughs> so we are now finding more and more examples of stone tools, sophisticated stone tools. So these are the type of stone tools that 
no living ape could ever manufacture. We've done we've done a lot of experience on uh, experiments on that. We're finding butchered bones, um, more human foot bones, more human footprints, and a partial human skeleton, and they're dating to the time of three to four million years ago. So this, these, we should consider these, uh, you know, rude fossils. They're appearing where they should not appear. So here's a picture of some recent. This is 2016. Pad experts found more footprints in Lake Tole. Remember, if you went through the book, Mary Leakey discovered fossilized footprints in Tanzania in the, in the seven, 1976, 1977, 1978. Around that time period, they found uh, thousands of, of trackways, and among them were human footprints. And so now they found more of them. And this is interesting because the new footprints I'm showing you here, uh, this is called Site S. So it's a different site. It's, it's equivalent age, the same tough they date. Is 3.7 million years old according to conventional data methods. And if you look at those footprints, they look anatomically modern, don't they? And so, they're, in fact, they're actually pretty large. And so, they would, this individual would have had larger uh, shoe size than me. <laughs> and they describe him as chewy. It's supposedly the biggest Australopithecus on record. The problem is we've never seen an Australopith with um, with perfectly human feet that are clearly associated or anatomically associated with a skeleton that is something that's not human. <laughs> so what's the what's a more reasonable interpretation? Well, the reason why these footprints look so human is simply because no, humans did live that time, live that long ago. And um, during the time of Lucy, I mean. And here's another skeleton they found, a partial skeleton. This is found also in the far region of Ethiopia where the remains of Lucy were found. And this skeleton was nicknamed Katanumu, which means big man. And so here we have, uh, large footprints and a large skeleton. And so, um, again, this is, this, and, if, and if you've looked at these bones enough, when you see the skeleton, you instantly say, that's a human skeleton. And that's how experts in the field are describing big man. They say, this big man skeleton looks like a modern human skeleton. And so they're now trying to redefine how they see Australopithecus. They say Australopithecus looks much more like Homo erectus, which as I mentioned, has a human skeleton and lumpers say is Homo sapiens. There you go, guys. Now we're getting into the studies where you can see the different footprints that have been found and how they've been investigated. And here's one in sand, and here it is, um, you know, under thermal imaging. So. Look at this. You can count every toe. And notice they're all right here, not out to the side. Look at this. Human footprints right here. Seven million years old. Is that is that the Crete one, brother? Yeah. Yeah. And what's funny is with the Laetoli ones too, you'll see because um, the, the Laetoli footprints aren't the only one. So this is the one in Crete, and Erica is constantly going over this paper because they're they're desperate, right? They need to try and say that these footprints were intermediate when in fact the data i'm going to read i'm going to read word for word from the, the horse's mouth again this is what really destroys them yeah look at this <laughs> and it's just so funny watching um guts of gibbon with um she resorts to a, a paper where they're trying desperately to say that because clearly it's it's human but they need to say that it's either intermediate or it's not quite modern human. Let's read this. Okay. Mary described the fossil impressions as a well-preserved trail of undoubted human footprints. Let's read that again. Undoubted human footprints. Isn't that funny? And listen to this. Remarkably similar to those of modern man. Um, down to here. Let me see. Mary writes, it is tempting to see them as man. Now, remember, a lot of the times, because someone in the chat said as well, it's circular reasoning, right? Well, it's too old for modern humans. Therefore, it can't be modern humans. Do you see how their worldview, their basic assumptions, basic presuppositions are preventing them from concluding the obvious? So let me continue reading this. Uh, it's tempting to see them as a man a woman and a child. Whether or not this is so, the middle-sized individual was stepping deliberately in the prints left by the largest. Now, here's a quote, okay, from, uh, let me see. Okay, so let's, 
Let's read this. Make no mistake about it, okay? This is coming from their side. Remember that. This isn't creationist. They are like modern human footprints. Here we go again. If one were to, uh, if one were left in the sand of a Californian beach today, and I talk about this all the time, here it is out of the horse's mouth, and a four-year-old were asked what it was, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. He wouldn't be able to tell it from a hundred other, yeah, there you go, put up on screen, Matt. He wouldn't uh, be able to tell it from a hundred other prints on the beach, nor would you. The external morphology is the same. How about that? There is a well-shaped modern heel with a strong arch and a good ball of the foot in front of it. The big toe is straight in line. It doesn't stick out to the side like an ape toe or like the big toe in so many drawings you see of Australopithecines in books. And I mean, you know, you can go on and you can read all about this yourself, quote after quote, you can go down deep, stay down long, come up dry. But I mean, it's funny because every single fossil, everything in the, um, Paleo community is contested. That's why what Erica will do in her response, here's my prediction. Once again, ignore all the genetics, pick out 0.1% of it, thinking she's addressing it. Probably misrepresent it like you've seen at the beginning here with the genetic diversity and created heterozygosity. Um, but what she'll do is she'll cherry pick a quote from one expert in the field and then ignore all the other quotes from the other experts in the field and not actually address the data. Because anybody can find a quote from anybody to support their position, <laughs> you know, and especially when it's too co too close for comfort for the militant evolutionists. Well, now they are searching far and wide for that expert, that paleo expert that agrees with them. So it's just, it's, it's a lot of uh, psychological warfare. Uh, go ahead, Matt, what do you think? What I really like is the size of the foot. Remember, evolution is going from small to large when it comes to the hominids, right? They're always showing the brain case being small and then it growing over time. But then when we look at the humans, right, when we're looking at these tracks, what are we seeing, right? They thought that this person was like almost six feet tall. He had a size 10 and a half foot, but yet all of these missing links, right, are around three and a half feet tall. Isn't that ironic that the very foot that they're saying is our are these other species are that are their intermediaries are larger than most of our feet today <laughs> pretty funny to me crazy so it is it is and you know if they're trying to convince creationists they they need something better <laughs> cuz all of this circular reasoning when it comes to the fossil record, when it comes to the genetics, when it comes to the orphan genes, when it comes to the DNA function, when it comes to the linkage blocks. Erica, you know, if you're listening, why are there so many large linkage blocks? If deep time evolution is true in the human genome, okay? Because if deep time evolution were true and we've been evolving for millions and millions and millions of years, okay, then recombination and gene conversion should have scrambled all linkage blocks to nothingness. The fact that we have so many large linkage blocks in light of recombination and gene convergence speaks of a young genome. Why is there so little variation in the Y chromosome? Why is there so little variation in the mitochondrial DNA? Then they're going to resort to the hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck. How is that even remotely feasible? So they just need better arguments. See what they hope for, Matt. Do you agree with this? They're hoping to prey on ill-informed creationists and Christians that don't know the data, that don't know this, that can't call them out on it. Those are your so-called former young earth creationists. You ever seen the former young earth creationists, quote unquote, on like Dapper Dino's channel? These are the people that, um, like I was debating Wayne Fillmore, you know, he's supposedly a former young earth creationist, never heard of genetic entropy, didn't know what phenotype, genotype was, didn't know anything about the best lines of evidence for young earth creation. These are the former young earth creationists. That Eric guy who loves dinosaurs, he's obsessed with it. I mean, this guy couldn't argue his way out of a paper bag. <laughs> so these are your former young earth creationists. It's sad. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that. yeah. What I do is I just ask them. I said, uh, they go, oh, yeah, young earth creation doesn't, you know, it's not real science. And I go, oh, oh really? Um, uh, could you name to me a single prediction in young earth creation? You'd never get a reply ever. Like they can't. There's no way they can even throw one, not even one at you. So they don't really keep up with anything. So their opinion is pretty moot. You know, like you said, it doesn't. Who cares? I mean, they were. It's like saying, 
Yeah, I used to. Uh, I used to be a runner. Oh, what you do? <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, I ran around the block a couple times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, or like us, like like me and you, we're really into competitive, um, like fighting, wrestling, judo. That would be, and I I coached wrestling and wrestled for years, and you've been in MMA for years. <laughs> I'd be like somebody saying, you know, I'm a former wrestler wrestler you know and you ask them a simple question about like what's your favorite move or what do you think about this technique and they have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> exactly exactly oh. it's, it's crazy really but you know that's on them hey if they wanted to say that they were one i don't i don't know what they get out of it i mean paula gia doesn't even remotely know any of the evidence it's funny no. Um, we have what you what you do buy Kent Hogan's first book and say, oh, I'm a young creationist. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Tony Reed. Right. And I wanted to point one one thing out, too, to put everything to bed, be as detailed as possible. Check this out. I'm going to read this as well. Endo scans reveal cognitivity for modern human brain. OK, with uh, the Hobbit. Um, what can we gather from all, the, all this confusion? Is Hobbit a legitimate new hominin species or simply a unique people group belonging to the human race? Listen to this. As with Erectus and Nelidi, the question is, is it human or just nearly human? An evaluation of cognitive capabilities is one of the most informative lines of evidence to consider. Here we go. If Hobbit shows evidence of the features of creativity, complex language, which, which we do find all these lines of evidence, forethought, design, craftsmanship, and other advanced mental processes unique to modern man, it would be difficult to deny its humanity. But remember, when it's too close for comfort for the evolutionists like Erica, they have to deny the humanity. How did it get to the island? I want to know. I guess it just randomly got there, an interbreeding population, I guess, on uh, you know some raft or something. It's ridiculous. But I want to read this part. It says, um, in 2005, paleoneurologist Dean Falk and a group of evolutionary paleo experts published a paper in the journal Science describing LB1 brain shape. The shape of Hobbit's brain was digitally reconstructed by taking CT scans of the interior of the brain case. The researchers compared the Hobbit's brain shape to that of chimpanzees, Homo erectus, and a modern woman, and a modern human who suffered from microcephaly. Here it is. Their comparative analysis revealed that Hobbit looked most similar to who? Homo erectus, only smaller. Surprising. Exactly what our model suggests. I'll read this one last part just to leave no stone unturned. As Falk concludes, these regions are especially important for higher cognition in modern humans. And it's a good guess that they were for Hobbits too. Not according to the, well, I'm not quoting anymore, but I'm not according to the militant evolutionists, of course. So I'll continue. It is evident that Hobbit was capable of complex decision-making, reasoning, creativity, and even language. How about that, eh, Matt? Corroborating evidence for this is based on advanced tools and artifacts found in the same strata as Hobbit's remains in Liang Guo. Hopefully I didn't butcher that. But the evolutionists have noted that the stone artifacts associated with Hobbit exhibit a level of sophistication on par with those of human craftsmen. Yeah, th this is all just a fatal blow. Uh, they, they, none of it's on their side. Um, <laughs> an hour and 40 minutes demolishing, you know, I guess her field specifically. <laughs> but we're getting into some some goodies here too, Matt. So unless you got some final words there, brother, we can move on to this. Oh, I don't even know how to close that out. I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> the subjective interpretations coming from these fossils again. I mean, when they, when they find conflicting data, like we just covered, and those large footprints, they have to invoke that, well, they're there, but they shouldn't be. But there is an explanation, but it's evolution. That did it. but you don't even know what the story is yet. You just admitted you don't know what the story is yet. Right. It's definitely evolution because it's true. That's circular reasoning, and they just don't see it. That's why they're so blinded to it. You know, their indoctrination is a powerful thing. I constantly, you know, I teach in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu the most. That means that we fight off of our back for a, a, a very high majority of the time because it's a very beneficial place to fight from. But when you grab a wrestler, like let's say I were to train you and I were to say fall to your back, 
you know how hard that's going to be for you as like a collegiate wrestler? Right. <laughs> you right. are not going to want to do it. Even no. if I tell you, it's completely fine. It's safe. Don't worry about it. You have been trained indoctrinated to believe that that is the last place you need to be. It will take you longer to unlearn that than it would be for me just to walk up to some random person on the street and say, Hey, come here. I want to train you. So it's just the same thing with these evolutions. They can't see it, even though they say, no, I understand what you're saying. Well, you clearly don't because even emotionally stunted has corrected you in your own chat. <laughs> <laughs> right. With, with no rebuttal. And I love that. I mean, that video was just the worst. Well, it's funny because it's true. Indoctrination is strong. Like what you're saying, when I um, got out of college and I was done with wrestling, done coaching wrestling, I got into judo, jujitsu, and grappling. So now it's the opposite. Wrestling is about pinning. You know, you, you want to get on your stomach. You don't want to get pinned. You don't want to be on your back. Now in grappling, jujitsu, and judo, it's opposite. It's all about submissions. And I loved arm bars. I loved Kimura, triangle chokes, but this is a totally different game now because when you get to the ground, you're on your back. You want to get them, you, you want to get your hooks in there, but <coughs> coming right out of wrestling, like you said, your, your body's so used to one thing, your mind's so used to one thing, you're indoctrinated. It's, it's the same thing. It's a great point, brother. Yeah. That's why the kids don't stand a chance. You know, now we are throwing a curveball at everybody because the topic is now going to change. She is talking about, of course, genetics, you know, biology. She's going to be getting into molecular clocks here with Ong Ra. She's going to be teaching him. So get ready, everybody. <laughs> Actually, before you start, I just want to put one last thing to bed. So when Erica comes back with her response video, or you go watch her video, and she's cherry-picking papers and quotes trying to say that uh, Homo floresiensis didn't come from um, – Erectus came from some astrolopithecine or maybe the uh, habilis hypothesis. Just um, remember, we, we've already sufficiently dealt with why that's wrong. Primitive features, we've touched on that, how it can be the result of pathology, disease, things like this, mechanical stress. But here, here's a quote. As paleo researchers write in the Academia des Sciences, I guess it's French or whatever, 2016. Okay, here's the quote. We also, and this isn't creationist, we also suggest abandoning the name Homo floresiensis to designate small homo erectus. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Just like creationists are saying. And we recommend putting homo floresiensis into synonymy with homo erectus. Funny. We don't got a problem. We don't have to change our model. We don't have to cherry pick rescue devices. We're happy with, with the data. Uh, we can just use the quotes, the papers from the paleo community themselves to prove our model, demonstrate our model. They assume deep time evolution. So like Trinkos, they don't come to the exact same conclusion, but even with the Trinkos paper, when it comes to survivorship, stress, inbreeding, Erica likes to say, oh, you know, he's only looking at Neanderthals or only looking at Heidelbergensis or whatever, um, you know, she wants to complain about when in fact we've spent an hour and 40 minutes showing the overlapping nature of the fossil record, showing the uh, coexistence, intermingling, showing all these islands, insular dwarfism. Is this all a coincidence with Floresiensis, Nelidi, Luzonensis? Um, pathology, disease, this seems to be the rule in the fossil record when it comes to these hominins. So um, she's not going to be able to get out of this one. Um, without circular reasoning, cherry picking. So let's get on to the goods. Let's get on to some genetics, Brother Matt. So go ahead, man. All right, here we go. No, you know Nathaniel Jameson? He's the guy who... Um, Never heard of him. You're going to have a ball. <laughs> Never heard of him. He was in an after show with him. <laughs> hey, I just want to point out, Aaron Ra is extremely irrelevant, outdated at this point. Um probably why he won't debate or discuss these topics. So and we can see it here. For sure. Oh man. Yeah. He's, he's way behind. Jameson, when he was trying to get his, um, his mutation rate, cause right. He's, he's basically looking at mitochondrial DNA and trying to prove that, that mitochondrial Eve lived 6,000 ish years ago. Yeah. I was reading a paper today that, that called that. And a, what was it? it? It was some kind of egregious error. So, She's talking about Dr. Jensen's mutation rate. He's talking about an entirely different thing. He doesn't even know what she's talking about. <laughs> One ear out the other. Yeah. Right over his head. Woo. Yeah, 
read, yeah, I read a paper today on mutation rates, and uh, they were wrong. Yeah, they just used some kind of an error. So I'll let him continue. But I just wanted to point that out that he doesn't even know what he's talking about here. So <laughs> With Aaron Rod, you can just let him talk, and and he'll dig his own hole. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I just wanted to point that out because he obviously has no idea what she's talking about. But he wanted to he wanted to bring up since she actually said a word he recognized, you know, mutation rates. He felt as though <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. So, but he doesn't. I would love, and I'll go on. I would love to debate Aaron Ra in a timed rebuttal debate, extremely formal. You know, a couple ten minute openings, and then just like three to five minute time responses so he can't, cause here's the problem with, with Arn. When his worldview is being destroyed or he hears something that he can't address, bam, he's gonna interrupt. It would be so fun to demolish him in a timed rebuttal debate. And we tried to set that up, a few of us, and he, and he denied because uh, he's not interested in, in a sophisticated intellectual discussion. And just judging by this conversation, it would be bad for him. He'd have to retire, put it that way. Oh yeah, I praise even offered him um, to debate me to pay. He paid him to debate me. Remember, he said no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be. Could you imagine just having free reign to just not worry, have to worry about him interrupting, and you got your five minutes to just throw out all the empirical data at him and watch as he can't address any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said, though, he's irrelevant at this point. He's just he is. Yeah. So yeah. that. He's he's irrelevant in what uh, his technical knowledge is, but he's not irrelevant in the fact that he has a huge following of people that right. think he's relevant and smart, but he's not. So we're going to pick him apart in this as well. well actually, it's a good it's a good thing you, you brought that up. So uh, everybody in the audience can probably tell that we've really spent a lot of time on Dr. Dan, Erica, a lot of these critics. Oh, and what's funny is that they're a lot more intelligent and have a lot better arguments and put out better videos than who we are about to go attack. Because we're confident, um, and I'm sure everybody is just looking at our, our last, um, you can check our playlist section for refuting the critics series. Um, they've been significantly dealt with. We've had no real rebuttal response. So we're now moving on after this one, since we're leaving no stone, stone unturned, we're gonna hit them hard. Our, the Iron Raws, the Pelogias, Vice Rhino, Professor Stick, like all the big names, with the, and we're going to call them out. We're going to destroy their videos, and it's it's going to be fun. It's like the it's going to be just like how we went on to Kent's channel um, and destroyed the ERVs debunking Pelogia. No response because they can't they can't take on educated arguments. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> we got a lot of things coming up, but here we go. Because yeah. it's supposed to be a range, you know, the, the highest and lowest, you're supposed to get a moderate in the middle. And um, I, I can't remember the way they described it, but I remember just saying that they, they, they came up with a figure that if you do it really, really wrong, it could be so far off base as to be 6,000 years. Right. And and the problem was two, two very quick ones. One, to get his mutation right, he used dyads instead of triads, which you require a mother, a daughter, and a grandmother to get like an accurate germline mutation rate. Um, and if you have a dyad, it, it can always be somatic. You, you don't know for sure. Um, but more egregious is for his generation time, right? He needs a really short generation time, even with that completely off-base mutation rate, um, to fit it into 6,000 years. All right. Where to begin with this one? So I guess I'll just read from this quote right here real quick. Substitution rates among humans appear to be much higher rates than inferred from human chimpanzees comparison, which are the phylogenetic methods. So when she says, or he says, these uh, these rates don't line up. They they have to be assumed. They have to, it, they're just mathematical errors. Well, unfortunately for them, the mathematical errors are so in favor of us that they want to point out that they don't match us, but they are so far from matching their model, it's ridiculous. Now let's move on here while I break this down for you, okay? Because she specifically mentioned two separate things. One she was mentioning, uh, he mentioned that the models don't do the math correctly. So let's look at actually how they did the math in a couple different ones. In humans, this yields a rate of about one mutation every 300 to 600 generations, or 
one every 6,000 to 12,000 years, assuming a generation of 20 years. This is the, uh, from a report, uh, I would say in the late 90s that came out, that was talking about the DNA, uh, mtDNA and protein differences between all the great apes and their divergence rates. So this was their prediction. It would be very, 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 very slow. But that is not what we found. What we did find is this. How, and from pedigree studies, which is trio studies, remember her complaint was Jensen looked at dyads and not triads, and triads are trio studies, meaning three, three people. So how, was able to estimate that a problem, a mutation probability arose in the same woman born in 1861, yielding an overall divergence rate of one mutation every 25 to 40 generations. And he's talking about Parsons here. He said, both of our studies came to a remarkably similar conclusion. Those studies were published back in 1996 and ran to about 1998, 1999. But regardless, the mutation rate was exact opposite of what they actually predicted. Remember, they predicted one every 1,250 years, or one mutation every what is it, 600 to 1,200 generations. It's the exact opposite anyway. So visually, what we found is the exact opposite of what they did. Evolution predicted one every 300 to 600 generations. We found one every 33 to 40. So how did Parsons actually come up with that date? Like uh, he said, oh, if you make an error, it becomes that way. Not at all. Look, here's how he did it. Very simple. He took 133,000 years, which is when Stone King and Sherry here actually determined the last uh, bottleneck occurred. And then they he simply divided by 20, the fold difference between mutations rate that he actually obtained with Howell. Guess what? That came up to 6,500 years. So there was no error. There's no like low baseline and high baseline. He just did the math. He goes, well, if these people right here are correct and when the bottleneck occurred and I say the mutations rate is 20% faster than expected and I just do the math, boom, that's it. Real simple. He didn't have to, he didn't have to do anything. He, he, these people literally believe in evolution. They're not trying to get young earth creationist timelines. They just simply did the math and they got that as a time period. That's it. So Aaron doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And Erica is talking about an entirely different subject. So this is fun. So we'll get we'll go on now because we're gonna get into what she was saying about the fifteen generation or fifteen year generation time because she's making a point here. Fifteen is a generation time. He uses the lower end of a thirty percent figure as the universal for the entire technical paper. All right. Here's that technical paper. Since a 15 year generation time is at odds with the typical practices of today and in the West, my initial thoughts were to continue to favor the prediction that I had made previously. So that's why he used the 15 years. He made a prediction and therefore he was testing his prediction with that, that he made earlier. It wasn't that he, well, he, he looked at the evidence and went, well, the evidence is going to line up to this generation time. So therefore I'm going to say that. No, his prediction was printed first. So let, let's go on here. Okay, here we go again. All right, so empty DNA mutation rates and then converting the mutation rates by the ones per year, demonstrating 100, here's the, here's the important factor, 115 nucleotide differences could have arisen since the flood, assuming a generation time of 15 years. So we're gonna look at that table in a minute. I just wanted to show you that 115 nucleotide differences is the maximum differences between all humans alive today. Okay, so that number is important. And then assuming the generation time of 15 years from his earlier prediction would uh, arise at this. So let's find out what happens when we actually download the table and we look at it. So what you're looking at here is that table. On the right is the total pre-flood and post-flood world, okay? So if what you're looking at right here is 22. Now he predicted that up until the flood from Adam until Noah, about 22 nucleotide differences would have arisen in that population and then boom, the flood hit. Then after that, the rest of the mutation nucleotide differences would have occurred. So using his generational time average of 15 uh, and going back to the flood, we have right around the average of what would be expected with the 115 nucleotide differences we see in the world today at the high end being here and the low end being down here. So his prediction was actually very, very close to being correct with, yes, using a average worldwide 
generation time of 15 years, which he predicted based on my, what I'll point to next. But let me back up in time. Um, the nucleotide differences weren't just between African people. The actual highest diversity of these 115s goes all the way down to the African San individual and an Asian Taiwanese Aboriginal. That was actually the biggest diversity that they could find. So that was the largest gap that they could find in all humanity. And so, again, using the date of the flood, which Answers in Genesis says was 4,350 years ago, he's obligated to stick at that rate because that's what Answers in Genesis says. If he was unburdened from Answers in Genesis time of the flood and actually pushed it back to a reasonable 4,500 up to about 4,900 years ago, he would have not had to... Yeah, well, he might even not have made a prediction around 15 years of age. He would have probably been able to use it 20 year age average because that is an actual more, I, I believe, relevant time of the flood. And therefore, the numbers would have been much easier to match. And also remember about these differences, they arise quicker in times of bottlenecks. What do we have in our model? We have two bottlenecks from creation and then it gets the, at, at the flood, which would have also sped up these differences. Just throwing it out there. So. Here we go again. Let's let me go on because I am going to show you the next picture and you will see the chart on why Jensen actually used this rate. You can see he didn't just say, well, all here, I'm going to use the this time range because it's uh, I'm going to assume the ancestors did this. No, he actually chose. Uh, he he said this is what ancient ancestors did and it matches the data. And that's what we see even in Africa today. Small tribal populations, look at the average rate of births. Most women, over 50%, have a child or two of them before they're even 18 years of age. So there it is, real simple. You can see why he made the prediction. And now let's move on. Rational Mind asks, um, I have a question for Jensen. Uh, you cite pedigree studies to get your mutation rate. In one of your papers, you mentioned that you can't be sure if you're getting uh, gametic or somatic mutations. In the book, you don't mention this important caveat. Why not? Good. So this is this is a very helpful question uh, for a number of reasons. One is if you Google like Jensen mutation rate, you'll come across the Filthy Monkey Men blog, where they basically imply I've confused. And Herman Mays actually has a comment on that from April, where he's asking a question. You can see in there. Uh, where they say I'm confusing the somatic mutation rate with the germline mutation rate. So that really what I'm detecting in mutation in, in these in this particular study. Let me back up for a sec. You can you can see this all documented in my papers, the references there, and get the primary literature. But one of the main studies uh, that I was using in this particular example was a massive study of Sardinians and their mitochondrial DNA, and I was deriving a mutation rate from that. Uh, and I and, and this filthy monkey man says Jensen missed this point. Well, actually, another example of people not reading what I write. Oh! And so I appreciate the question because uh, it shows that this person's actually read the literature. So why didn't I why didn't I give that caveat in in the book itself? There's four reasons why. Number one, if you look again at the history of the papers I published, uh, there's there's been a, there's sort of two sets of mainstream mitochondrial pedigree mutation rate studies. The first set, there's 12 or more of them, I think. Look at the D loop. It's just a subset of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, there, those are germline because they're looking at multi generation pedigrees. You can look up all that literature, it's publicly available. Some of it's behind paywalls, but anyway, it's out there. And that gave a, a mutation rate, one mutation, it's, it's one times 10 to the minus fifth mutations, I think, per base pair per generation. The second set of mainstream papers looks at the entire mitochondrial genome. And there I took all the data and it came out basically the same 0 0.95 times 10 to the minus six. It's basically rounded to the same number. So there's across multiple studies, a strong agreement. Actually, there's five reasons I didn't give the caveat in the book. Uh, so the first one is there's agreement between these two sets. S second is the paper wasn't aware of 2016, Mark Stone King's lab, one of the leaders mitochondrial DNA. He's got a paper that's against genome research, 2016, like 220 Dutch pedigrees. There he measures uh, the effective, he, he measures the mitochondrial bottleneck. And if you look at coalescent theory, you'll find out that the bottleneck size is equivalent to the population size. And there's a whole lot. So John Perry didn't get a chance to get into this last night, but actually what happens in mitochondrial DNA is there's a mutation, there's heteroplasmy that drifts to fixation. Anyway, you know, if, if you know the bottleneck size, that's, a, that's an indirect way of getting the mutation rate, and it gives basically the same answer as those other two. 
Thirdly, uh, or fourthly, whatever number I'm on now, this leads again to testable predictions about dating the transatlantic slave trade. That's basically a mutation rate free study. It's looking at branch length ratios, which is effectively a substitution rate measurement. This is giving, and it, it anyway, it'd be a whole other discussion presentation to discuss that. Hopefully, there'll be a paper that comes out this fall. Uh, but that's in agreement with it. Plus, lastly, and one of this, one of the things I point out in the comments, you can see one of the in, in the comments of that filthy monkey man study. Uh, in the book, I go through multiple other species that give a similar answer. So the fact that it gives consistent answers across these multiple independent data sets, it's leading to testable predictions that are working. That's given me confidence that, in fact, we probably are looking at germline. If you look at a family tree, and there it is. But let me back up because I forgot to mention something that's very, very important. And that is when you are looking at the nucleotide differences between all people, I want you to remember that 115 differences are all that we see. And when we're looking at the rates that match up and that actually show that the, the nucleotide different rates that are, are occurring and there are only that many of them, how come they are so close to our model, even if we have to use this unrealistic 15 year old generation time, right? How come there's so few and how come it's so close to our model yet so far? from the evolutionary model. I mean, not far, completely off the grid far, like not even remotely in the same ballpark. It's like looking at an entirely different sport. That's how far off it is. Yet they're gonna complain, oh, they used a 15 year generation time to come up with those numbers. Okay, so let's say he used an 18 year and it didn't really line up or it was, uh, it was lower. Well, remember, we still have a couple bottlenecks we could have resorted to, which he did not, probably in favor of evolution, like he always does for some reason. I wouldn't. And, um, but yet, that they're so far off from your model, and yet that's completely neglected. Always neglected, actually, because it's like, it's like stepping on nails and complaining that, hey, you're over there stepping on tax. It's like, hey, you, hey, you got seven nails in your foot. You're about to you're about to die over here from bl blood loss. You know what I mean? You're 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 focusing on the wrong thing. Look at how um, how awful your model is doing because of this. It's very very clear that the evidence is not on your side. Stop worrying about the little tiny problem on the creation side because there's definitely answers and that can be derived and given for these little discrepancies. There is no answer on your fry side for these discrepancies except for horrible rescuing devices. Anyway, let's move on. Where were we? We're about to hit up Carter right here. This guy's a beast. Let's do this. We probably are looking at germline. If you look at a family tree, take two people who had the same great great grandmother and look at their mitochondria. How different are they? How many mutations do they have? It turns out there's on average one mutation about every other generation. That means that this tree is only a few hundred generations. That's exactly the time frame from Eve. The average human generation time is 30 years. If you take 6,000 years divided by 30, you get 200 generations. That's exactly right there. We're not struggling here to explain Eve. Eve is falling well within the realm of biblical probability. When we talk about hundreds of thousands of years, those are just evolutionary assumptions. They're not actually using measurable mutation rates. Look at the most common mitochondria in Europe, group H, V, and R. I have a group H mitochondria. About 80% of Western Europeans do also. But can you see these branches have different lengths? These people all have a common ancestor, yet this group has picked up twice as many mutations as their cousins. Wait a minute. If you can pick up more mutations in the same amount of time, you can't look at the number of mutations and know how old a branch is. That means that you cannot look between humans and chimpanzees and say, oh, they're X million years ago. It doesn't work like that. Their conclusions are being drawn from their assumption that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. But when we look at it, everything falls into the biblical time frame and the biblical pattern this is very strong evidence that the Bible actually is true. So the Bible claims there's one male ancestor and one female ancestor. That is not a requirement of evolutionary theory, but it is a requirement of the Bible, and it happens to be true.
All right, so what do we know? We know that there are hardly any fixed differences between human populations on different continents despite extensive adaptive divergence. So we know how many fixed mutations there are, and there's very, very, very few. Okay, so that's one thing that we do know. So looking at that haplogroup, let's focus on Q. Now, what's Q? These are Native Americans. So we know they, they originated probably around here, and they migrated across and came into North America. And then they migrated down, and they went into South America. So we know this is the last area that they migrated. Knowing this, we would also now assume, since it's the last, that it happened at the same time. So they probably migrated together, got into South America, and diverged. So now we can make an obviously a logical conclusion. And this would be looking at the genetic data again, looking at here and go, where do these Native Americans fit? Well, we know now that looking at the haplogroup Q, look at this. Some are very long and some are very short. Now, what would do this? Well, think about South America for just a minute. On, on one branch, you have uh, very few mutations and on others, you have a lot. Now, why would you have less substitutions in one group and more in another? It comes down to population growth, and it also comes down to population size and birth rates. So when you don't see a lot of fixated substitutions, like here, you have the Aztecs. Here you have the Mayans, which were massive civilizations. So they have lots of people. So you're not going to get fixation reached very quickly. That's obvious. If a mutation arises, that's dominant and it needs to reach fixation. Well, if there's 100,000 people, it's not gonna do it very quickly. But if you go up here and you get to Brazil and you look at the tribes, like for example, the uh, Tanuka, they were very small and they stayed small. So fixation was reached quickly. You're not looking at millions of years here. You're not looking at hundreds of thousands of years here. What you're looking at is population size and and, not deep time. That's the most important thing. So we know that they migrated into the region at the same time. So how can they say that these are millions of years old? This is only genetic evidence and genetic data. This isn't using the fossil record. This isn't using assumptions. This is what we know about genetic data, about the Thousand Genome Project, right? So they went in and they looked at the genome of all these different people and they go, look, not very many fixed substitutions in these people. Oh, now, and there's, there's very few over here, and there's, there's a lot here. So it's all over the place, but yet they're the same people. They are cousins to one another. So how can they be related cousins that migrated to the place at the same time and be so sporadically different? It's clear and obvious that this is not deep time. That is the assumption that evolutionists give because they need deep time to account for the substitution differences. And that is not true. We know what's affecting substitution rates. And that would pretty much do it on this. Let me move on, see if there's anything else. The Bible also says we don't have common ancestry with chimpanzees. I'm looking at the, the mitochondrial data, and I don't see any evidence for it. I have looked at thousands, I mean 50,000 mitochondrial genomes, and I have spent hours and days of my life lining them up and examining them on a computer. And I got them all there, and I've tried to add uh, – chimpanzee mitochondria to that alignment and i can't do it by eye i can't say oh this piece matches this piece is obvious for humans it's totally obvious you try to add chimpanzee it's like it's like they're from mars they're so different as if we really don't have a common ancestor we've got you know seven billion people and we all look different how do you get that much differences in just a few thousand years well actually you as an individual you carry about 3 million places in your DNA where the piece of DNA you got from your mother has a different letter than the piece you got from your father. So maybe mom gave you an A and dad gave you a T. Somewhere else, mom gave you a C and dad gave you a G. 3 million places, but there are only about 10 million common variants found across the world. That means you carry yourself about one third of the world's genetic diversity. And if you took a bunch of people with your ancestry, specific ancestry, maybe five or six or seven people, you probably have 95% of the world's diversity just in that small group of people. That means that we're all very close related. It would be easy to fit those 10 million variants in Adam. And the reason you only have 3 million 
is because your mother and father are more closely related than you might like to think because of inbreeding, because you haven't had the ability to marry people across the planet until just the last couple of decades. <clears throat> reveal to put all the people in the world into Adam and Eve. Modern geneticists have been slow to admit the race of the Matt, pause that real quick. <clears throat> Um, I'm just loving how you're destroying this, brother. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, can't wait to not see these points get addressed as usual. <laughs> but you see what he's saying there? So when we actually look, and, and this all goes back to the created heterozygosity hypothesis. <clears throat> I've explained this many times. It's beautifully consistent with our model. And as Dr. Carter is saying, we can look at all the people around the world and you heard it from him, there are only about 10 million variants, more or less, that are found. These are the ones that are very common and they are not disease causing for the most part, okay? Of course, we're living in a fallen world. Now, would we call these mutations as the evolutionists would assume? The evolutionist assumes that all DNA differences are the result of mutations over time, which we know is impossible due to the deleterious nature of mutations due to their hypothetical out of Africa scenario. So these could have most certainly been the variants that God engineered into Adam. And that's all that would have been needed. Just like uh, Dr. Carter there iterated, you and I have about 3 million places. Okay. Where the copy, as he said, that we got from our mother differs from the copy that we got from our father. Therefore, we carry a, a, by ourselves in our own genetics, three million differences. It's not a huge stretch to simply say that Adam carried 10 million. Okay. And therefore, because we only carry a subset of the world's diversity, of course, if we have 3 million roughly, put the world's diversity into Adam. And over time, these genetic variants spread out. Those 10 million variants are actually found all over China. We find them all over Europe, all over Africa, all over the entire world. The question is, why is this? Well, it's because these variants were in our population, obviously, before we spread out, which means those variants were on the ark. And ultimately, that means they were an atom. This isn't complicated. The evolutionists don't read our literature. You can find this in technical papers from Carter, Sanford, obviously, um, Jensen. All of this is perfectly consistent with allele frequencies around the world, why chromosomes are geographically specific. There's no ancient divergent Y chromosome. Same with the mitochondrial DNA. Incredibly low variation in Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. You even heard it from Carter there when he adds in chimpanzee mitochondrial DNA. It doesn't make sense. It's all a mess. And isn't it funny how this is perfectly consistent with our model, okay? But the evolutionist has to assume some type of near extinction event 70,000 years ago in Africa. That's not even remotely feasible given the fact that all of these deleterious mutations that have been accumulating for generations and generations are now going to come to the forefront. They're going to be manifested and they're going to lead to rapid accelerated genetic degeneration. So I, it, what Carter is saying here, guys, you know, pay attention. I'm trying to break it down too, but it's fascinating stuff. So can't avoid it anymore. This is Luis Quintana Mercy. He's a famous geneticist. He says, oh, we need a big word. Phenotypic. Ooh, big word. Um, you remember in high school biology, you learned phenotype and genotype. Genotype is the genes you carry. Phenotype is the way you look. And the reason there's a difference is because you might be carrying a recessive gene that might be overwhelmed by a dominant gene. So even though you're carrying that gene, you can't see it. See, I have brown eyes. I have four children. Three of my children have blue eyes. So obviously I'm carrying genetically the blue eye trait, but phenotypically I have brown eyes. Genotype versus phenotype. The genes that explain the phenotypic differences between populations, the way people look, only represent a tiny part of our genome. Confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. All of those things that Darwin and his disciples and their descendants wrote for 150 years has been destroyed by modern genetics. 
We are one species, one people, and we're all very closely related, just like the Bible says. Uh, I spent more time pretending to be learned than actually oh. learning. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Perfect way to end that one. Perfect way to end it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. It's we look at the human genome and we see youth. We see it everywhere we look. We look at single nucleotide variances at the human population, and we find there's very, very little. Uh, we look at substitutions. How many are fixed? Very, very few. But yet the substitution rate is high. They have to tap dance around all this and say, well, there's a study over here that didn't find any. Yes, cherry picking data. That's how they get you to choose what evolution is. But when you don't know that when you're a kid, therefore you're indoctrinated. You will never know the truth because they will hide it from you at all costs. Well, it's yeah, it's amazing how all the data, and I like how he breaks it down is the fact that when you look at that phylogenetic tree, there's not a lot of mutations there. Okay, how did the evolutionists get to their 200,000 year date? There's not a lot of mutations there. They're easily explained in the 6,500 year date. We see allele frequencies around the world. We see, um, and that's why we went into the common variants. We can tell, for the most part, what's created, what's not. Just look at that, which is rare, which would be genetic mutations, say, post Babel. And that's why it's so geographically specific is because of the spreading out at Babel. We've got the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, the mutation rates, for example. They're fast. It's, res it's resulting in testable predictions that are falsifiable. Um, Dr. Jensen speaks of an active research pro program where he's got fascinating results. You know, why are they working so well? So these are problems that are never going to be addressed. With the Y chromosome, the chimpanzee, uh, nobody has, has answered it. Eric has attempted, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. If deep time evolution is true and their rescue devices on the human Y chromosome, because uh, it's 70% it's dissimilar, dissimilar to chimpanzees. Human Y chromosomes should have signatures of rapid evolution, lots of DNA sequence variation among humans, but they do not. There's no highly ancient or divergent Y chromosomes on this planet. We're all 99.9% .9 similar. Um, human males in their sequence diversity in the Y chromosome are incredibly similar. Um, so it's just, it's evidence upon evidence. The direct evidence is in favor of the biblical creation model. Um, but yeah, you know, good luck, I guess, to Gutsy Gibbon on attempting to <laughs> refute, refute you, refute me, Dr. Carter, Dr. Jensen, Christopher Roop. I mean, this was, yeah, this was a good video, man. And of course, anybody in the audience, we've been going for almost two and a half hours, so we're getting tired. I think we're going to call it quits here. Uh, you guys know we could talk about this all day, but I just want to say, if you want to hear even more details on like molecular clocks, African genetic diversity, um, linkage, disequilibrium, and everything, we've addressed it all. Uh, check out the, I'll put it in the description box, check out the Refuting Critics playlist. Um, because we love discussing these things. So I hope everybody had fun. Uh, Matt, any final words, brother? Uh, not I can think of, man. That was that was good. We, we went over as much as we could regarding those subjects. So, I mean, yeah, I don't want to deviate off anything. <laughs> I, think no, it, yeah. so. I think it's perfect place to end it. I'll, I'll put the playlist and the videos. Uh, definitely, when it comes to dating methods, watch that nearly three-hour video where we had uh, Jeremy blessed us with, um, that night <clears throat> with his knowledge on that topic, and we hammered down the evidence from the Rape Project on um, observations in the rocks themselves that accelerated nuclear decay has occurred. We touched on the heat problem, touched on evidence for the flood, the flood model, so check that out. Um, check out all the other videos. This has been fun, guys. We got a lot to, uh, for you guys to look forward to. We're going to be starting to hit. We got some videos from Iron Ra, Pelogia. <laughs> We're going to have fun. These guys don't know what's coming. So, um, yeah. Thanks for being here, guys. It's been fun. Thank you, Matt. That was a blast. So, I think we're going to call it quits. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night, guys. Saying for truth is out. God bless. <laughs>